Okay, good afternoon, uh, colleagues, uh, students, um, and Andy, uh, and uh, and Professor uh, Menpi Hora uh, from the US. Uh, thank you so much for coming for the seminar today. I understand that there are like 30 something people already online. So welcome you joining the session as well. So we are very honored that we have a very first time in PolyU, actually, we have a joint research seminar between two departments from LMS and SFT. Uh, thanks for uh, Professor Andy Young's uh, support. And, uh, and uh, we, 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 we're really happy that uh, we have Professor Manpi Hora to share a topic that is also relevant to both the School of Fashion and Textile and also the uh, Logistics LMS uh, department. And uh, Professor Manpi Hora is a rep well reputable uh, scholar in the, op in the field of operations management. And he's senior uh, editors for POMs, many departments, a few departments, uh, department editors for Journal of Operations Management, which is the, the one of the most important journals in our field. And he published in Management Science and uh, many other uh, top tier journals. So we can definitely learn a lot from his experience and his insights in research. So um, he is from the Georgia Tech uh, University. And they also have a textile department work very closely with our school. So, uh, but uh, Professor Hora is from the business school, uh, is also uh, from this very reputable uh, 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 university. So the topic today um, is design, designing reward structure for crowdfunding campaigns. So many fashion designers are now taking their project to uh, crowdfunding platforms like Kickstarter. And uh, many of them have been very successful to get international uh, acceptance from the customers uh, and the potential customers. So uh, the crowdfunding is also a very important avenues for uh, startups to get their idea funded. So it's also a topic that for any business school would like to explore. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Hora, today uh, coming to uh, PolyU visiting Hong Kong. It's the first seminar since COVID in face-to-face so that's, he flies like 30 hours flight to come to here to see you. Uh, and so we welcome them, welcome him for uh, for this talk. Okay. So I pass the time to you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. You have to say good afternoon back again to me. Good afternoon. <laughs> okay. And hello to everybody who's online on Zoom. Uh, my name is Manpreet Hora. And, you know, Chris gave a very glowing introduction. Uh, the first to be back after the pandemic is no, I've not climbed Mount Everest. It just so happens uh, I'm the first person back here. Really, really a pleasure to be back in Hong Kong after many, many years. And thank you to the Department of SFT, the School of Financial <clears throat> Fashion Te uh, Textiles to invite me here and the Department of Logistics and Maritime Studies as well to have me here collectively. The topic is a mouthful, designing reward structure for crowdfunding campaigns. My intent is to talk for about an hour on this topic, and then 15 minutes, just a view on publishing. Uh, you know, there is no magic bullet to publish, but there are certain ways we can reduce the probability of being re rejected. That's what we can say. I think there is no magic bullet uh, for publication. Uh, my email address is here because there may be certain things we cannot cover. By all means, please reach out. We'll be happy to share the paper. We'll be happy to take any questions because one hour may not be enough there. Uh, the people on Zoom, can you hear me? Well, yeah. So if you see a yes, uh, that's great. Uh, I just don't want to lose any audience uh, to match. You know, sometimes we're talking. So as I do this, I also want to acknowledge my two co-authors. Param, uh, this was his PhD's one dissertation topic. He's now a professor in Alberta, University of Alberta in Canada. And uh, they have a business school there. He's there. Karthik is a person in innovation. I predominantly work in supply chain as well. My research has developed over the years, like anybody who's been in the profession for a while, uh, it changes. I started working on operational risk uh, in my first five or seven years because I came from industry 
And there I was working in operational risks. So I started looking at product recalls, any low frequency, high impact type failures. And once you start doing that, a question comes up, hey, what's theory here? What's the conceptual lens? So we picked up on learning and knowledge management. From there, I jumped more into processes. So once you get tenure, you broaden your horizon. I looked at routines. And then, you know, I brought in innovation as well. So we look at these three elements and the underlying aspect is where is, uh, is learning and knowledge management. So, you know, from tenure, I moved to, uh, as an associate professor there. And now as a full professor, I'm looking more at aspects to cover things like crowdfunding. And there's a lot happening. Business models are transforming now. And as business models transform, we in operations and supply chain have to be wary of those as well. So again, the topic is designing reward structure for crowdfunding campaigns. And I'm sure, you know, in this part of the world also, entrepreneurs find ways of getting their products out and getting funding. How many of us have heard of Kickstarter as a company? There you go. So about 10 years ago, somebody exposed me to Kickstarter. And what I was looking at Kickstarter, I found something like this. So nothing was available in the market. So this is, any idea what this is? All right. Selfie holder. Like a selfie holder, it's like a laptop stand. So you can put your laptop here. It can go with you, like maybe 300 grams, right? And I... But this is, I was sitting at Starbucks and somebody talked of Kickstarter there, you know, the Starbucks people start talking and I went to the website. Somebody had introduced a product like this. It was not on Amazon that time. And it was $75 by the company called Roots. Now there are many knockoffs. And I paid $75 and they said, we are going to give you a reward. The reward was for $75, you get one product. It wasn't out in the market that time. They said, they're going to take three or four months and it took about four months, and I got this by mail at home. So the product was being in inception. Had I paid hundred and forty dollars, I would have got two, not hundred and fifty. So that becomes another reward. So you contribute. There is a creator. I am a backer. I am backing them to take this product out. And in return of the money I give them, they give me a reward. So our topic is designing reward structures for crowdfunding campaigns. They're going to the market. They're not going for VCs, to venture capitalists, for campaign. I'm sorry, uh, I need to hold the mic. Uh, they're not going to venture capitalists for raising money. And they also get feedback on the product. They can, they're getting money before it's produced. And they're getting from consumers. They're not getting from, they're not financing from somebody else. So that's the, the broad topic to study. In that topic, let me show you four products that came out from this Kickstarter. You see an elevation dock for an Apple product where you could charge it early on. There is a memorable laser razor where you don't have to put the razor on your beard. You just have to do it and it'll cut off rather than touching your skin because some of us have skin sensitivity. Number three, is an Oculus VR headset, a virtual reality headset. And number four is a Pebble Time smartwatch. So let's play some quiz right now. What do you think, if you may not know, was the most funded campaign on Kickstarter till December 2021? After that, they changed some rules. So I have it. To, if you have to take a guess, one, two, three, or four, you can write on Zoom. One, two, three, or four. Anybody in the room, take a, take a shot at which one it is. PhD students, come on. This is for your contribution grade. You know? <laughs> yeah. Any guess? Which was the most funded campaign on Kickstarter? Certainly, it wasn't the laptop stand. So it's lying there. But what other products? They have hundreds of thousands of products that have come out here. Maybe number one, uh, it was actually number four. Okay. Now this was a watch. Well, some, somebody wore Fitbit, somebody's wearing Apple watch, but Pebble was a watch that came out. They asked for $500,000 to make the product. They got $20.4 million. 
February 2015. So look at the magnitude. So for us, when we say designing for success, we are asking for the money you asked for, was it raised or not? Because what Kickstarter does is if you do not get the money you asked for, they do not give the money to the, the creator at all. It goes back to the backers. They take a cut from the middle. So they are a platform. There's a reason I showed the other three as well, because they have really good stories. Uh, and I want to share that with you. This one was the first campaign to raise $1 million. Uh, they wanted about 800,000. They got a million dollars. Uh, sorry, 75,000. So actually much more than that. So they raised 1.2. This was one of the highest funded campaign that never happened. So Kickstarter changed rules. With the laser product, they said, we're going to get it out. But guess what? They didn't have the technology. They had the patent, but they could not make the product. So they got the money, but the campaign could never happen. So Kickstarter said, well, we want to see prototypes now. We are not going to let people just say we want to have a product. It's not out. So that's a challenge for these funding platforms as well. This one uh, is they wanted $160,000 for the razor. They got $4 million, but they had to return all the money back. The last example is a company which asked for two, uh, $250,000. They got $2.4 million, and it was acquired by Facebook for $2 billion as well. So the, uh, they were the, one of the first companies where Mark Zuckerberg, who was the founder for Facebook, wanted to go into VR, virtual reality, and they were acquired uh, by Facebook for about $2 billion. So a company which wanted to raise $250,000 got $2.4 million, but was sold for $2 billion. Yeah. So very intrinsic aspects uh, that come out. So our research question we want to study is, if you look at the re reward a crowdfunding area, and if you've not started it, this is just a simple textbook slide. One is you can have a rewards like we talked about. You pre-order products. In doing so, you give the money and you're also supporting innovation. These creators are, are, are finding quality check. They are not going out. So this is a real nice way of helping. The second one is nonprofit crowdfunding, right? Uh, somebody has a health issue. They can't afford it. Uh, somebody's going to raise money on their behalf and people are giving and the return they're getting is only an intrinsic value. You're not getting anything in return. You're just supporting them. The third is lending. It's like micro lending. You can lend to real estate companies. You can invest. You can say, I'm going to put $10 or a million dollars and you're going to get something in return. So that's your money. You're expecting your money back, but you're expecting something else as well. The fourth is equity. In the US earlier, you had to go through securities and exchange commission to raise stocks. But now if you want to raise $1 million, you can raise it through equity and they don't have to go on the stock market. So I can start a company, I can list it and I can use equity and I'll receive company shares in the end. Now, obviously the company doesn't make it, it's like buying equity or buying stocks. So our intent is just to pay attention to the rewards-based crowdfunding, like the products example. Now it couldn't be products, it can be books, it can be experiences, it can be drama. So for example, last year, somebody said, I'm going to write a book. And they just put their idea of the book. They wanted $1 million, they raised 50. Or something of that sort because people are expecting to get the book in return. So it has a lot of series of aspects that they have here. Any questions, comments so far? Anything on Zoom? No. Let's carry on. So time. So if we have to give a definition to crowdfunding, it's an open call on the internet for funds. And as that, Kickstarter itself, since it started uh, in 2009, they, they do release some numbers sometime, $4.25 billion has been pledged by 16 million backers. So if you and I give money, we are backers. The ones who uh, are running the campaign are creators. And Kickstarter in the middle is a platform. 
So the first question we want to study is what is the association between number of rewards and because you're giving rewards, you have to design and success. And success is the money you asked for, you got it. Second is, how is this association moderated by dispersion of reward prices? So for example, I can have one reward for $10, the other for 100, the other for 1,000, or I can have for 10, 20, 30. So we want to cover that dispersion, the variation of prices in backing. What type of rewards are they? Are they more experience-based? Are they more product-based? And finally, does the creator's experience play a part? So if you know, somebody like Chris has a, the 10th campaign on crowdfunding and he's had nine successful ones compared to I who's never raised money and I try to raise, would it be different? Everything else constant. So we have one direct effect and three interaction effects we want to study to capture success here. Now, literature exists in this area. We aren't doing anything that's out of the, this thing. So the three broad way literature has been captured. One is on the phenomena. And when I put the word phenomena, it's just crowdfunding in general. Uh, what you see on the left side is there's a paper by JBV, which said tapping the right crowd. How do you uh, capture that? So the, you know, Belflam and all have done a lot of good work in this area. If you move to the other side, uh, this was a paper in MSOM by Gad Alon and Vlad Babich, where they looked at crowdsourcing and crowdfunding in the manufacturing and service sector. It's a conceptual piece, and they're trying to say what different ways would you be changing if you're in the manufacturing sector or in the service sector. So this is on the phenomena in general. Then there is on performance, okay, like we are starting on success. That's an outcome variable that we're interested in. The two papers I mentioned here, one is an MSOM, which they look at uh, if you have crowdfunding, they can be referrals. And if they're referrals, does that improve success? The other paper by Cornelius and Gokpinar came out in management science. They look at how customers, what role do they play? And can that improve crowdfunding success? Uh, they looked at Kickstarter data like us as well. So the earlier exam is the research on phenomena. Then there is research on performance, like what's my KPI, what's my outcome variable? And then is on the mechanisms, how it happens. And there are two papers I bring out here. One was in organization science, is how do you signal to the crowd? Because there's so many competing campaigns at the same time. How do you signal to the crowd? And the other one is in MSOM, is again looking at signaling and is there a way of bringing out some quality information? So this is just on crowdfunding that you can see the umpteen number of papers that are coming out, either on the phenomena, either on performance or on mechanisms. Now, I've mentioned those here. If you look specifically on those papers, is this, number two is a paper on what motivates for people to go on to uh, go on crowdfunding? If you go uh, and look at five, six, and seven, you know how do backers who come on uh, on crowdfunding what motivates them? Where do they look? Are they waiting for some other to first back? So, for example, somebody says to you, "Hey, only ten products are left. Would you behave differently?" Or hundred people have already. Uh, committed to this product, would you behave differently? A lot of people in marketing study consumer behavior. Similarly, they're studying backers behavior. So the field is a little, for a lack of a better word, crowded uh, as this work is coming along. So uh, there's a lot of good literature that's happening in this area. But what you're seeing here is the reason I wanted to bring this slide. It also tells you, we are while the phenomena of crowdfunding is relatively new in the last eight to 10 years, we are still studying topics that are important. We are studying heterogeneity. We are studying choice overload. We are studying risks. So we are studying topics that have already been there. 
we are just starting, we are looking at them in a very new business model there. Any questions or comments, anybody? So I also want to have a process chart. So I asked my former PhD student to just draw out a chart. This doesn't exist, but we created a chart of how the whole process looks. So crowdfunding is if you are a creator, she has an idea, she creates, goes to the platform of crowdfunding that's in green. If you've already signed up, then that's a decision. You create your project, you design your campaign. Remember our title is designing reward funding campaigns, right? So you design your campaign that's in blue there. And then it will be approved by the platform. If they don't approve it, it gets canceled. You're out there or you go back again and revise. And then you put a funding period. That's generally 90 days now. So let's say you want a million dollars, you get about 90 days to raise that money. You can keep a lesser day number of days as well. Then you and I start pledging. We see this on their website. If you're interested, we start pledging to them. If within the duration, the money, the goal is reached, the money is released to the creator. So you'll notice from goal reached, to the funds to the creator. And then what you see in red here is they have to fulfill rewards. Now, if the money is not reached, they return the funds to the backers. So when we use the title success, we mean whatever money you asked for, that money was raised. Any questions on this? Simple, straightforward, but just leads out. So as creators, they generally want success. Please, Chris. Okay. So let's say there are some examples you proposed that was uh, based. They asked for 1 million, they got way more than that. Yep. They'll get the whole money. They get, they get all 20 million. Yeah. No ceiling. No ceiling, yeah. Because, but the question is, they should stop as well. Because let's say they said, we're going to give you this. And we'll also have one gold-plated one. I'm just making it up, right? A gold-plated one, but they can only make five. So they have to stop the number of rewards saying, gee, we can't make more than five. So, but you're right. They get the whole money with them. If they ask for a million, they uh, get 100,000, they get nothing. Now, just to also, uh, there is also a platform that started where it's called Indiegogo. Whatever money you raise, you get it. And we try to control for that for robustness. Because, hey, what if we were on a different platform? So, but in this particular platform, Kickstarter, which is the most, one of the most famous ones, you either get the money or you don't. But if you get above that, you get all. Yeah. Please, Andy. Exactly. So what, what type of information do we need to provide? So let me go to there. But our intent is to study this part, designing reward funding campaigns. Yeah. So the information, let's pick up an example. This is an example of a design wallet on Kickstarter. They are going to give some information of what the design is. It's affordable. It's made from titanium. It has a minimalistic design, the size. Uh, and then they're showing you something new versus old, how it looks. Uh, like this is, hey, this is the one you have compared to the one you carry in your pocket. Then they'll tell you, so if I go on the website today, it tells me 761 backers are already there. We are looking for $28,000. We've already raised $31,000. So they'll give info. This will keep updating real time dynamically. So they're giving information on this. Then they will also tell you for the amount of money, how many rewards you will get. So what you are pledging, so for here, if you pledge $48, this is what you get. If you pledge $38, this is what you get. So they're giving all the information. They break it into different rewards. Does that somewhat answer your question, Andy? Yeah. So it's a pretty lengthy page, and they give you how many, what's the time period they're looking for. They also tell you when you're going to deliver the product. 
So within two months, somebody may have a longer time period as well. Yeah. So the website has one page and it goes starting with this and it keeps carrying on down. So every campaign gets a page from Kickstarter. Yeah. Any questions on Zoom on this? Everything looks good. Anybody here? The PSC students are being too kind. They're not asking any questions. <laughs> so we just talked of the literature review as looking at crowdfunding as a phenomena, crowdfunding as performance, crowdfunding as mechanisms. We just picked up a quick example to Andy's point, how does this look like? Now let's briefly just talk of the hypothesis and then we're gonna talk about the data. So again, these are our research questions. It's relatively simple, but there is a reason why we picked this up conceptually and why this matters. So the first hypothesis is looking at number of rewards and success. And what we say here, folks, is uh, if you have a lot of rewards, you will have success. But if you increase too many, it's going to be a diminishing returns after that. And we looked at the literature. The literature talks of uh, several reasons they give. Uh, one of the most uh, obvious one is a younger and leper, uh, where they talk about the cognitive processing cost for backers becomes a lot. You have some sort of a choice overload. After a while, if you keep giving you too many choices, you get fed up as well. So there is an optimal point of number of rewards you need for having crowdfunding success. But why do you need more? You need more because we all look for variety. We want some heterogeneous valuations. So before the choice overload kicks in, you need to have some choices. And those choices will be positively related with success, however, only to a certain point. So that's our hypothesis one. This relationship is great. So we are expecting some sort of a curvy linear relationship, which means it goes up to a point and then it reduces. Then we say, well, can factors like dispersion of reward prices, types of reward matter? Because remember, the aspect is designing reward, experience, designing reward structure. So what's designing? Number of rewards, how much we can charge, and are we a product category or an experience category? So with this, the second aspect we say is, Dispersion of reward, if you have the uh, dispersion is higher, your relationship will be weaker, which means when number of rewards increase, performance increases, but dispersion will reduce that down. And when you see the curvilinear effect, it's going to weaken the curvilinear effect as well. Now, what, what's the logic behind it? The logic is dispersion means, so if you think of standard deviation, if the dispersion increases, by increasing that, you have products that look very dissimilar. And when the, the dispersion is low, you have similar rewards. So what we are trying to show here is that relationship, whatever it is, is going to get weakened if the, uh, the dispersion of price becomes more. So the price itself is emblematic of the product. Then we look at the reward type. Now, this is a hard one to categorize. And I, I'll tell you how we categorize. So we picked up into either they are product type rewards or experiential rewards. So experience is, for example, somebody says on Kickstarter, I'm going to be creating some dance videos for you and you can buy those different. So that's more experience. You're, you're consuming an experience rather than a product. And what we are saying is 
that when you have experiential awards, it's okay to have variety. And that's basically we're trying to get at compared to products here. And again, if time allows, we'll come back to this again. The third is, sorry, the, uh, the third moderator variable, which is hypothesis four, is the experience of the creator. So the earlier three were campaign level variables. This is a creator level variable. And what we are saying is experience helps. When there is information asymmetry exists, I don't know if I will get this product or not. I order it online. Maybe they'll give it. I don't know how the quality is going to be. But if there is a creator who's already been on Kickstarter, who has built some experience, we will trust them more as backers. So as a result, because rewards can be delayed, some may not be delivered. So as a result, I will test the legitimacy by creator experience. So that uh, is such that if there is creator experience, uh, we will value that more. So if there is a curvilinear relationship, that slope will get weaker if the creator has experience. I'm looking at if anybody's sleeping or are they everybody's awake? <laughs> and we can come back to the hypothesis if the logic isn't clear on some of them. Yeah. So let's talk. Andy, do you have a question? Yeah. No. Uh, no, no. Okay, not yet. Yeah. Any question on Zoom? No. Okay, great. Yeah. I just wonder, can we uh, use that wallet page to illustrate what, 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 what do we mean by number of rewards? Exactly. We'll do that. We'll absolutely do that. So the next slide, when we come to data, uh, that's a great point. Okay. That's a great point. Yeah. Normally, it would be the funding funds that uh, something very expensive, they still do this. Or... Yeah, so the funding side, so this is, the question is uh, on funding side. So you will see number of rewards, about the mean is 8.9, right? The median is eight. To your point, funding goal, I mean, you can't see, uh, let me first go back to the data here. So the data came from Kickstarter. We wrote a Python code. Chris, any questions or we have forgot? Okay, great. So we wrote a Python code, a web crawler to get data from Kickstarter. Then we created the details, created a database of that. We have 196,000 campaigns over a 10 year period. We had to drop some out. Our final data set was about 191,000 campaigns, partly because there were some of them were just single reward campaigns, right? And there were some uh, of, and we captured both successful and unsuccessful. If you were on Kickstarter, we captured you. We removed some outliers of 1% funding goal. Those 191,000 campaigns had 146,000 creators. 25,000 creators had more than one campaign. It can be successful or unsuccessful before. The products, they have about 17 categories. Because we have a hypothesis comparing products and experiences, products were like art, craft, design, fashion, publishing, and technology. Experiences were comics, dance, films, food, games, journalism, music, photography, and theater. So technology could be software, for example, that they're introducing, or a new type of a phone or a watch that they're capturing. Show some descriptives. Uh, you will see the success, the first success variable we have is a binary variable. Did we collect the funding? Yes or no? And uh, zero otherwise. So you see the mean is about 59, which means 59% of those 191,000 campaigns were successful. The median is about one. So almost half were successful. 
The number of rewards, to your point, is for the titanium type example, is about 8.90 is the mean. Then we looked at the dispersion. Remember, we have a hypothesis two on dispersion. That we took the standard deviation to the mean of, mean of contribution variable. So we look at the coefficient of variation, standard deviation about the mean. How many categories were experiential? 57% were experiential. Product, we gave zero. Experience, we gave one. So you can see about 57% were experiential, 43% were, uh, if this scanner works here, yeah, this one here. Then we captured creator experience. We also have a lot of control variables. Of a lot of uh, campaigns, Kickstarter may like it themselves. So they put their seal of approval, they recommend it. That can play an influence, right? They're like an influencer. We also captured duration change over time. Initially, there were 90 days given, they moved to 60 days. That can change success. So we captured that as a dummy variable. There is also a funding goal to Andy's point. And the log here is about 8.4 to 8. So we capture the control, right? Because if the funding goal is higher, it may be harder to raise money. So we control for that. We control for the campaign duration. On an average, campaigns exist for 33.24 days. We control for the minimum reward price and the maximum reward price. We also control for the number of images and videos you show. So every campaign to go to the titanium wallet example, you can put videos there, you can put images there, that can play an influence, right? And other papers have shown that. That's how you signal. But because we are not hypothesizing for that, we control for that. We also control for competition. Some campaigns have limited rewards. Hey, this is a reward for five days. You take it today and then they'll remove that reward. Is the creator from the US or outside? And then obviously we control for time trends as well. That's just a log of the dollars amount, the log of the dollar amount, dollar amount. So because you have, so we put LN, natural log of the amount in dollars here. Yeah. Please. So what Kickstarter said is, you remember I, I showed you this picture here. Here. So when you design a campaign, till 2011, they said you can have maximum of 90 days duration to raise money. After that, they changed the law. It was like an exogenous shock. They said now 60 days. Because we have data going from 2008 onwards, we wanted to control for that duration change here. Does that help you, uh, this thing? Because for people, the duration elapse will be quicker for 60 days compared to 90 days, right? But you can be a creator. You are given 60 days, but you can say, you know what? I'll only give 30 days. So you can choose less than that, but that's the upper bound that the platform says. They change. Yeah. So going back here, the upper bound changed from 90 to 60 from June 17, 2011. Any questions on Zoom? No. I put pe people to sleep. So, so these are our variables of interest. What you see in green is the dependent variable. In blue are the independent variables. So the dependent variable, we calculated two ways because we wanted to show regress as well. So one is the success variable, the one on the top in green. Then we also said uh, to Chris's point, right? He said, well, what if I just want $100 and I get a million dollars? And I just wanted $10 and I got nine. 
but I didn't get the money. But hey, I was 90% there. And somebody was only 10% there. Because when I capture a zero as binary, I'm putting both of them in the same bucket. When I capture as a continuous variable, so first becomes a binary, second becomes a continuous variable. I can go from 0% raised to 10,000% raised or whatever the range is. Yeah. So we covered both as DVs here. Yeah. So um, the model is relatively simple. Uh, it's a linear model to start with the success. And then we include a B2 where you see beta two is looking at number of rewards square. Then we have uh, the moderators because we want to show their direct effects. And after that, we have interactions and a bunch of controls, a vector of controls there. You can see the controls again mentioned here. Any paper we try to publish now, you have to worry about endogeneity, right? We live in that world. We'll still be critiqued on this, but let's show what the good faith effort we are trying to put for endogeneity. Number of rewards can be endogenous. So we try to use an instrumental variable estimation. It, it's, if I'm a reviewer, I'll be critical, but at the same time, this is what we have right now. So the first instrumental variable we use is, we are thinking, how is a design, is a creator thinking of how many number of rewards should I give? So we, first instrumental variable we say is, average number of rewards in campaign in the same category of wh where you are trying to create your campaign in, within the 30, uh, previous 30 days before the launch of your campaign, and that has a funding goal of within 10 to plus to minus 10%. Obviously we create other, because this is an empirical way to do it. We don't have any conceptual reason. We, we talked to about, the good thing with Georgia Tech is we have quite a few people who raise on Kickstarter as entrepreneurs. So we could just, we asked a few people of asking them, how do they make decisions? But again, there is no conceptual reason for us to pick these numbers. So I want to be forthcoming to say it's more an empirical exercise than a conceptual exercise here. So the first category is within the previous 30 days, uh, range of 10 plus minus 10%. The second instrumental variable is looking at average number of rewards in other categories with a funding goal within the plus minus 10%. So one, we look within the same category. The other is the second category, the other categories. Our first stage then becomes the number of rewards is looking at uh, <coughs> the instrumental variables. And then the second stage is running after using the IVs here, the instrumental variables. Any questions or comments on this? So let's talk of the results now. So let me show you in terms of how the charts look. H1 was, anybody remembers what was the first hypothesis? PhD students, come on. What was the first hypothesis? I'm coming from a jet lag, I've had lunch, so I don't remember. Number of rewards and success. So the success is on the Y axis and number of rewards is on the X axis, which is the dependent and the independent variable. And you see that the graph there is a, the slope is stronger. The first variable is predicted success. Yes or no? Second one is the ratio, which is the second dependent variable. So this one runs an instrumental probit type model. That's an instrumented linear regression because there we have a continuous variable. In both cases, you see the slope increases and then it's downward sloping. Second hypothesis was looking at dispersion of prices. 
And what we said is at more, if you have low dispersion, uh, how would it look like compared to high dispersion? So if you look at the plot here, again, the first plot is on the binary variable. And what you're seeing there is, if there is high dispersion in prices, the slope is less stronger compared to if you have low dispersion in prices. Again, what's dispersion? Dispersion is, let's say I have three rewards. Um, now I'm looking at in those three rewards, if I have one reward for $10, $15 and $20, and I have another campaign where I have $10, $1,000 and $10,000, which one will have higher dispersion? The first one or the second one? The second one. Because for the same number of rewards, your price uh, differential is much high. If you have higher dispersion, you will see the slope is not that strong compared to where you have low dispersion. And again, the reason you're seeing two graphs is because we have two dependent variables to capture success. The third category was experience and products, where we said product and experiential categories will behave differently. And if you increase rewards and experiences, because people want variety when they take experiences, with products, they want less so. Our hypothesis for our main dependent variable was not supported. So the slope is almost similar. There is no difference in the slope. However, when we use the funding ratio as the dependent variable, that means whatever I asked for is the denominator. What I got is the numerator. When I use that dependent variable, we do see uh, significance kicking in. But the reason we say it's not supported is because our main variable was what Kickstarter uses here. Final hypothesis was on creator experience. This is supported uh, and you can see the line, if you have high creator experience, it's more, um, they don't have to increase a lot of number of rewards because experience trumps number of rewards. People pay more attention to legitimacy and credibility of the creator compared to if you don't have experience on Kickstarter, you are seen differently. You are more, so we use the word naive compared to the more experienced ones. And, and that sort of kicks in with both dependent variables here as well. So I'm being mindful of time. Uh, it's, I have about five minutes for this. So this was our question. We used three moderators and our key takeaways are providing more rewards improves the likelihood, but it also increases choice overload. So you have to be really mindful of when you increase the number of rewards, how far you want to go with them. In terms of prices, Reward prices work better with gradual rather than drastic. That's the price dispersion aspect we're trying to capture. Yeah. Creators, as they're designing the rewards, they should look at their own experience as well. You know, they will be valued more by the backers if their own experience is there. So they can be mindful of rewards. They don't have to increase uh, there. And finally, this last one wasn't supported. So we are just trying to now guess why our hypothesis wasn't supported between products and experiences. We had said backers likelihood of making a reward selection increases more with experiential categories than product categories. So there are certain limitations of the study as well. 
what we have not studied, we are looking at the funding side. We are not looking at the quality side. In supply chain and operations, we also want to see what feedback we get from backups. So if you're studying this topic, you can also look at how is the feedback captured? How do we improve products? We've also not captured was the products really delivered or not, right? After like six months, bloody hell, nothing happened, right? So that's an important aspect to capture too. The other aspect to capture is the ones that are really successful here, will they really be successful outside as well? So remember, I started with the example of the Pebble watch that raised the highest money. How many of you wear a Pebble watch anymore? So just because you were successful doesn't mean it translates really into the market as well. Now, Oculus became really successful. So we don't know the association between when you're successful, when you're prototyping, to really when you're out in the market. Because here we are early adopters who are really interested in buying the product. We are backing them. So we don't know those aspects. So it also says there's a lot of opportunities to study a lot of other questions uh, with this topic. So that's my presentation for crowdfunding. I think I'm almost at 3.30, 3.25. But if there are any questions, by all means, ask me. And I have additional slides as well, which I can then share if you're interested to know any more about the paper as well. I'm just going to put it in the... Okay. Um... So it's uh, time for uh, you to take a questions and um, the online participants, uh, please also type your question in the chat room. We can actually see it here. Um, so maybe anyone here would like to ask a question. I show, I give you the mic. Yeah. Please. Uh, I have a question regarding the figure of hypothesis three. Can you go to that page? Absolutely. Sorry, I'm going the the, uh, the figure of hypothesis three. Yep. Yes. The results, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yes, this one. So the figure on the right side is more interesting. So I'm I'm wondering why there is an interaction here. Uh, because it, in the left figure we can see they the uh the, the experimental category uh, dominates the product category. So I'm wondering why we have a uh, interaction point yep. in the right side. Yeah. So here you sh what it shows is if you have success is higher for experience compared to products, but the slopes are not very different. Remember, what are we studying? Number of rewards and success. Right. So as number of rewards increases, prediction increases. However, both of them curve. And what we were hypothesizing is number of, if you have experience, that will help you to have more rewards. Now, if you look at the right side, so the first dependent variable was the binary variable, one or zero. I got the money or I didn't get the money as a creator. The second is looking at the funding ratio, right? And for this, the dependent variable is funding collected divided by the target funding goal, irrespective of successful or not successful, right? You ask for $10, you got eight, you get 0 0.8, the log of that. You get you ask for ten dollars, you get one. You get zero point one, the log of that. Now, going back to your question, now let's look at the interaction plot. What the plot is saying is, the experiential category. Once the curvy linear effect kicks in, you do not. If you think about it, the products, as number of rewards increases, products become more successful after an inflection point. This is what our hypothesis was. This is what we wanted to do. But when we use predicted success, we didn't find the results, so we didn't support it. When we use the ratio, 
our hypothesis is supported. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, I see. Thank you. And I'm also wondering when you prepare the data, why you remove the uh why you remove the projects with only single reward Correct. level? Yeah. Correct. Because we were saying higher the number of rewards, and some the reason we removed one reward is sometimes those rewards are given free as well. So you don't have to pay anything. And they're looking for feedback. Okay. Right? So for us. That became a challenge. The second challenge it became is that reward hasn't increased. It's just one reward. So while we can study between one and two, we wanted to study to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. By looking at one, like for going to the titanium wallet example, if there's just one wallet, uh, that would be hard for us to, to capture. So we made a mindful decision. A lot of times when one reward was introduced, it's more like a donation. It wasn't a category, it wasn't success. So looking at the data, we've figured out, let me go back to the slide. That's a really good question. I should have clarified it more. So we removing single reward can, campaigns. We just, because so many of them were just, hey, you know, we're looking for donation. We're gonna give you a reward. Really hard to study. And, you know, you can't manually study about 200,000 campaigns here. Okay. Uh, it became really hard. So we, you know, we went through it. We found about 80% of the ones had that decision. So we manually didn't want to go through all. So we made the executive decision of taking all of them out there. Okay. And so the data preparation is also a very key parameter for your empirical study, right? Uh, look at how many hair I've lost. You know? uh, yeah. <laughs> you haven't seen my PhD student. He's bald. You know, well, it, it, it took a while. But what we did not do very well, and it's hard now, is when we submitted to management science, the feedback we got is, well, what if the number, uh, something changes along the way, right? Because you can see and say, hey, 30 people have already backed. I also want to do it. So we could, the, uh, when we started capturing from Python code, we could only capture 10,000 dynamically changes. Kickstarter didn't allow us to do that. So we have millions of, for every campaign, we try to capture every update as and when the update happened. But uh, Kickstarter made it really hard for us to do that. Like, you know, now Twitter has changed its rule as well. You know, they can't, they, so it's, that was a hard part for our APIs to work on. So we did dynamically capture some data, but this, yes, this is just three lines in our paper, but it takes a lot of time to do it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. There's a question from the, from the uh, online audience. Yeah, please. I try to read it. Uh, for so um so is there a question from uh Xiao Gan? Okay, I guess um and uh I'm not sure whether it's the person that I know from the from the Netherlands. Um he said a very interesting talk. I wonder how the funding scheme would affect the key result, for example all or nothing for the Kickstarter and keep it all for the Indiegogo. That's a very good point. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, uh, yeah. let you complete the. So one, one, one more sentence here. Uh, because the backers face more risk under the keep it all scheme, uh, and the crowdfunding campaigns are usually less likely to be successful. Yep. So very good point um, to the person who's asked this question. That's why I'm showing you the results uh, for both uh, Indiegogo type model and Kickstarter type model. The only limitation we have is the data is from Kickstarter, right? It's not Indigo data. If the data is from Kickstarter, but we are saying if it's an all or nothing model or a ratio model, we're trying to capture both dependent variables. That's why you see an A and a B. Where it differs now, the, I think the limitation of our study is we don't have Indigo type model data. We are assuming that the Kickstarter data, we can use the other model where you get the money, whatever is raised by showing B. And the results differ is on A and B, but between products and experience. Otherwise the results hold, depending what type of variable we use. But here we find our support for a hypothesis if we use the Indigo type funding model. If you use the Kickstarter type funding model, our results are not supported. 
So great question there. Great. So any more questions from the floor? Okay. So uh, I got a question because usually when we um, do pricing, so it's very similar to the pricing yeah. uh, topics that, uh, so sometimes our, our retailer, they price something higher. Yeah. Uh, that makes the dispersion uh, larger yep. so that uh, they actually want to sell something like the lower you know, one. The lower one. Yep. So in order to make it more uh, uh, appealing when they, the actual product they want to sell. Yeah, correct. So if we, so based on what the findings here, it does not work the same way in, in the Kickstarter because the, the, the dispersion, the larger the dispersion is actually less favorable Correct. to the to the uh, award. So what do you think? Why is not exactly the same Correct. like what we do in the wheat, uh, normal retailing? Yeah. So in this case, because I think the point's well taken here, just to reiterate the question, is price dispersion sometimes may help for selling the product. We are not capturing the product. We're capturing success. We are capturing the goal raised. So if I was looking at sales, right, uh, then I think uh, uh, the aspect is well captured. What we are trying to do here is we want to see from a backer's perspective, because what we do not know, another limitation of this paper is, I can have, how do we capture rewards? The way we capture rewards is, if this is sold for $75, and then I have a second one for $140, they're just selling two of these. That's different than selling a blue one for $90, a red one for $95, this one coming with a button and a remote for $170, right? So you can have a lot of product variety as well. We are actually capturing that all calling it reward variety. So to answer some of your question, what we've done as controls is we've captured also the minimum reward price that you have and the max award price you have. Because we can, that way, you know, control for certain elements that are there. But because we are looking at success, and the question is, does number of rewards affect success? And so if I'm selling two of these for $140, that's one reward. That's not two, that's one. One reward is for $75. The second reward is for $140, where you get two of these. So the intent is, if you want to sell volume and you increase the price, but you're not increasing it double, which means the dispersion is less. Now, if you're selling variety, then you may keep the dispersion higher. So because we cannot observe that, our aspect is the dispersion is lower. And if the dispersion is lower, you will get higher success. Now, that can affect different categories. So we control for categories as well because different categories can have different yeah. ways. Yeah. Okay, any more questions? If no more questions, you... you. Yeah, please. So first, thanks for the interesting talk here in this page. They, um, they, they experience, they uh, create our experience specifically means the successful experience or That's on this platform. Point. Yeah. Yeah. No, we just capture experience first. Mm -hmm. Then we, we use a robustness check for successful experience. Oh, so, but the question mm -hmm. is, is experience mm -hmm. because we know so let's say you have a lot ID at Kickstarter. As a Kickstarter, before you go there and you start creating, you already have a login. Mm -hmm. So if you are there, yeah. I know as a backer, mm -hmm. this is your second project. Huh. Right? I know already because you've done one. I click on your name, mm -hmm. I see there's another project. Mm -hmm. Your question is, well, what if the earlier one was successful or not successful? Yeah, yeah. So we control, we do a robustness check. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just wanted to see experience. Mm -hmm. and, and that matters, irrespective of success or non-success. But when we compare success, that matters as well. Mm -hmm. When we look at unsuccessful, it doesn't matter. But oh. the volume, the numbers are so small. Uh, but experience on its own also matters. So when I capture experience and look at that coefficient, comparing it to successful experience, that coefficient, mm -hmm. there is not a significant difference between that. 
But our hypothesis was just experience. So that means even the project was cancelled, that also increased the creator's trustworthiness. Cancelled in the way, no, your money was returned. Ah, uh, you yeah. didn't reach your goal. Mm-hmm. If it's cancelled here, no. 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 Then you will, your name will not be there. It's you re- try to raise money, you did not reach the goal. That's mm-hmm. unsuccessful. This red here. Okay. Not this one. Mm-hmm. This is Kickstarter looks at your, this doesn't even go to the backers. This is Kickstarter looks at it and says, nope, you will not be able to make it. So we look at this bottom red, mm-hmm. yeah, not I the see. cancellation part, but you take the time, the money wasn't raised. Oh, I see. Thanks yeah. for answering the question. So um, I think uh, as a Professor Hora also have a few more slides about publishing in top T journals. So maybe we move on to that part. Um, I do think that the, the findings of this study uh, will be very beneficial for uh, fashion designers. So when they start want to like to launch their products uh, in a crowdfunding platform, now they know have some tips to make it more likely to success. So yeah, so let's move on to the second part uh, right now. I have about five minutes. Can I go five minutes extra or? Sure, sure, talk? sure. I think we are happy to have a bit okay. longer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> he can really give you a few days, not actually one day. <laughs> so again, I'll be frank with you. I'm I'm little new. I'm still not. My experience is not like Professor Howley or Chris Tang or even you know Andy sitting in this room. So please take my views on publishing with a grain of salt. I'm the first one to admit I have more rejections than acceptances. Uh, I wanted to hear the same thing. I didn't want to say it myself, but uh, a lot of us have experiences. So there is, if you think there is a positive correlation between acceptance, experience and acceptances, it may matter. The creator experience may matter a little bit, but not a lot uh, as well. So what I did is I prepared some slides as Chris was saying what we want to talk about. So if you think of research journey, it's a journey. You know, we are all learning in this journey. I don't think this journey uh, ends. We all have our, like I showed you my aspect of publishing, sorry, of my research interests. Publishing is one aspect of the research journey, right? So, but we think of journey looking like this. We're trying to accept our paper, get accepted. And we think of reviewers who are standing there and you want to get the end of the journey and you see them standing there looking to reject your paper. Right? So you, you said, bloody hell, this reviewer didn't understand what I was trying to do. Right? Like, really? You have to reject on this? This is doable. We could have done this. Why is our paper rejected? So this is, you know, in our mind, you find those people standing there uh, at a different level. It's here. So I think if you talk to uh, quite a few of editors, they will mention the vast majority of papers get death rejected. Uh, there is a gentleman called Adam Edmonds at London Business School. He, I've taken this from him. He says, when he was the editor-in-chief for review of financial studies, of the 765 papers that were submitted in that year, 516 were rejected, test rejected. 516. 516 of the 765. That's a huge number to get death rejected. So my five or 10 minutes is, how can we reduce death rejection? How can we try and contemplate what reviewers may ask us? There is no guarantee for acceptances. Let's start with that premise, right, to, to do that. So Alex Edmund, sorry, he recently, I was preparing for the slide and I see a paper about um, two weeks ago and the paper is called Learning from Thousand Rejections. So he's written a paper. It's a working paper. If you go on SSRN, you will find it. He's written this paper called Learning from Thousand Rejections. So he picked up three aspects. He picked up on results. He picked up on trade-offs. He picked up on execution. Now, 
while this is finance, I think it's very valid to other business areas as well. So he's, what he did is he went through all the reviewers' comments. He picked up all reviewers' comments and he summarized those because he had them with them. And he then created categories like cluster analysis of saying what came out. So he used cluster analysis to from reviews to bring out certain elements. So he says, a lot of people will say results are insufficiently novel. Now, novel doesn't mean you have to do anything new to start with. A lot of our studies are don't have to be novel. But that's nothing you have to, in the first two pages, try and bring out the intention of the study and what it is going to contribute. Novel doesn't mean it has to be fully new. It has to find what I call, you know, if you play golf, there's something called PGA, right? Do we know PGA is golf? It's is a professional golf association. But my PGA is show the phenomena, show the gap. That's the second G. And then there's the A. What's the A? Phenomena, gap, and the A is the aha. What is the aha, right? In the paper. And that's how reviewers look at it. I mean, we may like it or we may not like it. In those three pages of the first, you know, uh, we still can't do it. As an author, I still struggle. But if I look from the other side, that's one. Second is, are the results important? A lot of times we just mention statistical significance. Mention the economic significance as well. Like a question you could ask me is, well, how many rewards and how much success? Show us, where does this relationship change? Is it six, seven? Show me the magnitude. And that's an important aspect to study, right? Uh, when you're doing the aspect of regression or event study as empirical work uh, scholars, people generally before reading your question know the, the side. Is it positive or negative? But you're telling how much. So I think that's what uh, Alex is trying to hit at. The third point becomes important for journals, which are like JOM, POM, MSOM. Is even if you're studying a topic that's narrow, try to make it general. So Alex used the word finance. I put it in parentheses because I'm saying topics does not fit a general interest journal. So you can study, I can study crowdfunding. I can study platform, but I have to bring some operational aspects to it. I have to bring some marketing as whatever journal you're submitting to. Otherwise, it becomes very esoteric. And, and that's where you, you'll have an issue from the reviewer's side. Think about our own papers. When a DE gets your paper, they have to find reviewers. It is not a trivial exercise to find reviewers. It takes a while to find reviewers. And the reviewers are coming with their own background and their own priors. So it's an important aspect. They're going to say, how does it fit JOM, POM, MSOM, whatever journal you're doing? So this is not taken from desk rejections. This is taken from reviewers' feedback. Results are generalizability is such an important aspect. The onus lies on us to explain in the paper up front, how can the results be generalized? Papers that have a trade-off are generally interesting and intriguing. But we start with that. A lot of times we don't come close the loop when we finish in the conclusion section. This is an easy one, but we don't do it well. Paper lacks clear hypothesis. Especially I'm talking of empirical work. Lay it out. It's, it's critical. And finally, he talks of empirical execution. This is endogeneity, which has become really, really critical. Explain your data well. You know your data. The reviewers don't. Right? And it's, it's hard. You don't want to take five pages. So you have to, this part, you have to keep rewriting to break it succinct. Use your co-authors for that. Use friendly reviews. Ask your colleagues to give you feedback. Briefly on JOM, uh, this you may have seen a Journal of Operations Management. Uh, if you're submitting a paper there, this is taken from the authors uh, from an article in JOM by uh, uh, Tyson 
uh, Browning and Suzanne de Trivel. And what they do is when you submit a paper, it goes to a managing director, editor. Uh, right now it's a she. She uh, takes that paper and assigns it to an EIC. That's an editor in chief. These two people at the bottom. They can then send it for checking methods. We have a, an editor who looks at methods. Then they can either, uh, from here, they can desk reject your paper or they assign it to a DE. DE assembles a review team after reading the paper. Some of the papers as a DE, I desk reject as well. These papers, so I get a review team. That a review team involves two or three reviewers and one associate editor. They write their reports, the AE sees the reports, and then makes a recommendation to the DE. The DE makes, a, I would say, still a recommendation. They use the word decision, but it's still a recommendation. In JOM, the decision actually lies with the, the editor in chief. It goes to EIC, then they choose between, generally between two, three, and four. That's the whole process. So in this process, a lot of us DEs, our role comes here where you see the blue circle. So any points I mentioned here before, they can look at the EIC, or they come at the DE level, or the AE level. So it basically is here. Some journals, the managing editor may tell you and say, hey, we have a page limit, a formatting style. There may be some logistics issues as well. Uh, some journals can be a little easy in the, as you submit your paper, and then they can come back to you uh, and ask you if your paper goes through subsequent rounds and makes it. So there is a gray area there. There's no specific rules and regulations there as well. If you are a try and become one. Even as PhD students, ask if your advisors are reviewing papers, as long as you don't divulge, ask them if you can help them review or have a look at the review say, I want to write a review. Now it will not be, they may not take it officially, but writing review is also an exercise. A lot of people as faculty sitting in this room spend a lot of time, or, or, which we call service in reviewing papers. So if you look at the reviewing role, you know, and if you watch, if you look at Superman, right, you have two, you play dual roles. One role you play to the author and one role you play to the editor. You are a boundary spanner. You are telling authors something. So we have responsibilities as reviewers to the, to the editors. So we inform them as well as to the authors to be a little developmental. So, what checklist can we look at as being Superman? Is let's our reviewers count. Rejecting, tell them something that's developmental. They can improve the quality of the paper. If people have, authors have spent three to five years on a paper, you know, we've spent as reviewers maybe three hours, five hours, two days three days. So there are positive aspects of the paper. Now, certainly you can still, they may warrant a rejection, but give them some feedback to say what's gone well. At times, give some reasonable suggestions as well. Like for example, in endogeneity, we know there may not be an instrumental variable existing, but we are all looking for one. If you have a suggestion, provide it to them as well. Have a flow in your review. And you know, if we can be timely, we are so busy, as much as we can be, uh, that would be great. So as you do reviews, for authors, reviewers are looking for, if you're doing them, explain your data well. If it's experimental, explain that. If it's large scale, explain that. In terms of methods, 
please explain the descriptives as well. We very quickly jump to regressions and, and res, uh, you know, the, explain your descriptives. Sometimes your data is telling you a lot. You know, your mean, your median, your standard deviation, try and explain that. Take care of your selection bias. All of us have selection bias. There is a, a colleague of mine who was the editor for Journal of Marketing. So when he stepped down from Journal of Marketing, he wrote a thought piece, an editorial. He said, the whole world is endogenous. Some people are going to say even God is endogenous, right? So which basically means any decision we make, it's endogenous. But if we can show some good faith effort, it's important. Also talk about not only the direction of the hypothesis, but also magnitude, if you can. And that's about it. I've gone 10 minutes over time. No, no, it's, uh, it's okay. Perfectly fine. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. And any question about publishing uh, uh, in the OM discipline? Actually, uh, JOM is uh, our flagship journals. Uh, so publishing there is one of our ultimate goals. And <laughs> we have department editors here. We have associate editors here. And uh, I'm a reviewer as well. So basically, we've been through all this process. Um, so this is our... Um, um, it's a good chance to ask any question if you would like. Yeah, I, I would yeah. expect, Andy, yeah. if you want to add something from your experience as a DE, <laughs> um, and maybe I'll let some student ask question. Okay. And if yeah. I, I, I okay. try to answer. Yeah. 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 Okay. Hi, Andy. Uh, thank you for the question. Okay. No. All right. So now um, I will take uh, Professor Hora as wise. I will ask you to help me to write some reviewer reports. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, I think it's a good exercise to yeah. start. Yes. To say, because remember, our papers are reviewed as well. So when you look at somebody's paper, we'll realize you become very critical. When we look at our own papers, we're not that critical. But by writing reviews, you realize, well, what others may be looking at in our paper. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, from, from your experience, what's the assessment very like for your head of paper? Yeah. And what kind of paper? I mean, uh, when you accept a paper, what, what type of papers that you see is most important and yeah. about your own experience? Correct. So, the, the question here is you know, if we look at the acceptances, so on an average, and I may be misquoting here from JOM. I don't have the slide deck with me, but generally uh, it's about at the four, three to 4%, maybe the acceptance rate, maybe 5% now. It went really down. Similar would be management science and MSOM. There's certainly less than 10%. So almost think about this. There are, if there are 100 papers accepted, sorry, submitted, only nine, seven, eight, six, seven, eight papers will see light of the day. This is not to discourage you. We all find a home. It sounds a little down. We all find a home. It just shows we have to be persistent. Because when we get rejections, believe me, it's a downer. We all get it even now. And it's sometimes you feel it, it sounds a little unfair. So to your point, what gets accepted? This one aspect is uh, if you're studying an important phenomena, it's a newer phenomena, you may get a benefit of doubt compared to even if it's not very rigorously done. So when I did initial work on product recall, I look at it now, I know I'm being recorded, it's a bad paper. Compared to now what I will do, but it was a question that was important. And I could do the best I could do with limitation of data. So while the reviewers were critical, the editors made the decision of saying this is something substantive. Reviewers are maybe little, the experience may be a little limited and that's where the editors kick in and they make a decision and saying, you know, this is the best effort they've put. Second is if the papers I read, they don't have to be long, but they have to be crisp and concise. Spend some time. English is not several of ours first language, including mine. This is something you want to use your co-authors on. 
my advisor used to say, people write a long paper because they don't have time to write a short one. Just think about it. Which means if you're writing a shorter paper, actually you're spending more time, but it's complete. The questions, if I have a question on data, in those two paragraphs, you've given me enough information. In the first round, submit your appendices. Remember, we, are, we don't know you. We only know you through your paper. We only know your data through your paper. We only know your analysis through your paper. So if you're getting, if there's a question coming to my mind saying, what's the number of rewards? Like Andy asked me a question, which I didn't answer. He said, what was the funding goal? Give me a number. And I've forgotten. That's why I didn't answer this question. I just told, showed him the log. But if a reviewer sees a log and says, really, you want me to not convert the anti-log to tell me what the number is? Tell me the average raw number. What are we talking about? How much is the value? Why did I take the first reward out? You give information to make it complete. That helps. That helps because what happens is as reviewers, we are reading the paper, question comes up, and I get really impressed if I see my question coming up and the next paragraph is already addressed. I will see the paper very differently. In the first round, do not make silly mistakes. I see an author's name not well cited or the year wrong. I, I, in my own mind, I'm thinking, is this work well done? And it may be well done, but as a reviewer, I'm looking at these three, four simple things and I'm quantifying. Right? The reviewers don't talk to anybody. They just write the report. They don't talk to the editor. They don't talk to the D. They are just looking at the paper. They are looking at its quality by looking at certain elements. So simple things like citations and the end. Do you have all references complete? Do not cite a wrong paper. Some of us may know the paper and say, gee, this is not this paper meant. And they are citing this paper for this particular justification. So simple mechanical things get it right. Uh, that really helps. Reviewers, because they'll say, hey, I see you missed three references. And they have already made up their mind that this paper is sloppy. Now, they won't say I'm rejecting your paper because of three citations missing, but they'll find other substantive reasons which could have been a revision, but now, you know, they don't, they're seeing it differently. It's their recommendation. The editor now sees, may see something else. But if three reviewers are saying rejection, it's very hard for the editor or an associate editor to go against the crane. You know, because you have to have, the editor himself or herself has to have a substantive reason to justify. The other thing that started to Andy's point is, a lot of journals have started something called reject and resubmit. It's a, frankly still a gray area, but it's giving us an opportunity that you have one door open because they're not many A journals, four or five, right? And I think uh, we want to utilize. Now, sometimes if this paper we submitted to management science, we know there's certain things we cannot do. And if it's rejected, it's rejected, you know? Uh, I wish we could do them, but we don't have the data. We can't dynamically see every reward changing and Kickstarter is never going to give it to us. But if that's a reason for rejection, you know, we can't help that. So we have to be mindful uh, ourselves as authors, because sometimes we, as reviewers, we raise a little bit of unrealistic expectations as well, but do not let them, you see the reviews, not everything will be doable, but give it your best good faith effort. The, re the response document, I, in my view, is an important one. If you get a revision, spend time on it. Because reviewers, when they get the paper back again, if, if it goes for reject and resubmit, if the department editor chooses to go to the same reviewers, I'm going to say, okay, how are my reviews, my feedback, how is it addressed? Have you written something there or not? Have you given a reason why you can't address it? Don't discount them. Reviewers are doing a service to the authors, right? And, and the reason they may have raised this point, you know, is not that you can say to them, hey, are you a moron? You couldn't see what I've written. No, they, because they couldn't see it in the paper. So you have, or you didn't explain well, or they may have missed it, but you have to address in some way or explain in some way. So 
roundabout answer to your yes, question. Yes, yes. Okay, this is a very uh, generous uh, sharing. And um, so I think that's very helpful to all the young colleagues as well as myself. Um, and, uh, and sometimes uh, well, we get very emotional when, <laughs> when, we, we, when we see our reviewers coming back and for the same thing. But, uh, well, it's the life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, and uh, we, we try our best to, to entertain them. So yeah, every date yeah. I went out to, I was rejected half the time or more than that. Yeah. So, you know, uh, uh, the question also becomes is to your point is we get emotional initially, but give it some time, go back to it. And certainly sometimes it's doable. It's hard work, but I think in this academia, a lot of people are smart who are doing PhD, but it's also diligence and persistence. Yeah. If any question from the Zoom? So no question from the Zoom. So um, maybe it's time for uh, we end here. Um, so let, let's uh, thanks again for Thank you. Professor Hora uh, sharing. So it's the very first time that we have the joint research seminar. I think we did make a good one. Um, and it's beneficial to both the uh, NOMS and also SFT uh, students. Yeah, so the, the dependent variable is success or not success, right? Yes, it's a, <laughs> that will be a success. <laughs> no, thank you so much. Thank you to folks who are on Zoom. And thank you for certainly for people for attending. Yeah. And again, I'm an email away. If there are any questions on the study or anything else, would love to connect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.